All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for coming. My name is Kate Tallman. I'm the chair of the HELP. I'm an accidental government information librarian webinar series. This series is brought to you by the American Library Association Government Documents Roundtable. Um, thank you again for coming. You'll be muted during this webinar, but we encourage you to participate in the chat. If you don't see a chat window, kind of hover along the chat icon on the bottom of your screen and type in your question. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, um, Kelly Wilson is on hand to help. Um, she has the name Zoom Tech um, also. Feel free to chat directly with her. And worst case scenario, please remember that this session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. Um, Real quick, I wanted to go over our upcoming webinar. Um, next up is November 15th. This is the Nuts and Bolts of FRUS, the Foreign Relations of the United States. Um, this is with Elizabeth Charles. She's a historian with the Office of the Historian in the Department of State, and she's going to talk about what it publish takes to publish a FRUS volume. If you have any topic ideas or would like to present, please let me know. Uh, my email is here, katherine.w.tallman at colorado.edu. And especially if you're a member of an ALA GoDork committee and would like to co-host an event, I'm always happy to talk to you as well. And there's going to be a short survey at the end of this where you can share your thoughts on today's webinar and future ideas for improvement. Finally, um, here's our YouTube link on the screen where you can um, see all of our webinars published on our YouTube channel and sub you're welcome to subscribe to our channel as well. So today I'm going to introduce our whole talk because I'm part of the panel. Uh, today's webinar is reporting on the world of government information, a panel presentation from the editors of Government Information Landscape and Libraries, which is a professional report published by IFLA in 2021. Today's speakers are Kay Cassell, a Professor Emerita of Library and Information Science at Rutgers. Jim Church, who is Librarian for Economics, Global Studies, Political Economy, and International Government Information at the University of California, Berkeley. And myself, Kate Tallman, I'm the Interim uh, Director for Rare and Distinctive Collections and a Federal Depository Coordinator at the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, here is an overview of our webinar today. Kay is going to talk about the contents of the webinar itself, or the contents of the report itself. Um, Jim is going to cover some of the editing and lessons learned there and what it takes to publish a report of this size, um, especially for an international organization like IFLA. And I am going to talk all about IFLA GEOPS and try to recruit a few of you in attendance into um, joining us and learning a little bit more about what IFLA can do for you. And you'll see here also there is a QR code that you could um, take a picture of and that will take you directly to the IFLA professional report that we will be talking about. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Kay and thank you very much again for joining us. Okay. Welcome everyone and uh, I'm glad to be talking to you about this report that we that we completed uh, a couple years ago now. Uh, it seems like just yesterday. Okay, so next. So the report is called the Government Information Landscape and Libraries. And I'm gonna give you just an overview of it in order for you to uh, have a sense of, of what is in this document. So the publication provides a summary of the government information landscape for selected countries and regions worldwide. And it provides information on such things as publishing practices, depositories, legislatures, access to information, government libraries, preservation practices, and digitization. Uh, the, the publication wants to make the point that government information is not easy to find. So government information professionals are needed to help users to find the information that they're looking for. Next. Oh, no, there should be another one before that. Oh, no, you oh, oh right, got it. Oh, you have Korea next to that. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start with Korea. And uh, Young Wong Yang uh, provided information on government publishing and preservation in Korea. There's, in Korea, there is no centralized or systematic government publications method. So each government agency publishes and distributes their own publications. I should say that 
um, the, the, the beginning of modern government publications in Korea began in 1950. But a recent creation, the National Digital Library, is being developed to provide better access for government publications. Next. Canada. S Susan Peterson uh, provides a history of Canada's government uh, document system. Uh, the government depositories library system actually goes back to 1927, and they officially ended printed documents in, in 2014. So most government documents are now available online, and this depository services program that's been in business for a long time is now an, a, 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 a DSP e-collection. And many of the government documents are available on the open government portal. Next. The Middle East and North Africa. So Mohammed Zahir, Bale, and Liz uh, Denner uh, focused on government libraries in the Middle East and North Africa. They looked at different kinds of government libraries, including legislative libraries, judicial libraries, and executive libraries, such as libraries of ministries and departments of government. The services include uh, document delivery and and research assistance. Uh, they, they, they commented that the libraries, uh, these government libraries tend to lack budgets, staff, and technology. So the authors have, uh, have suggested that the libraries need to work cooperatively through their library associations to strengthen the understanding of the value of libraries in order for them to be able to, to function more better than they are functioning now. Next. The Russian Federation, we could just say Russia too, but uh, our author did call it the Russian Federation. So uh, Anastasia Drozdova documented the progress made in the Russian Federation toward more access to government information. So since 2011, there's been an official internet portal of legal information. It's a website with legal, parliamentary, and judicial information. Um, more, more government information is now available on the official websites of government agencies, for example, the Federal Tax Service. And information is also available on the open data portal of the front of the Russian Federation and on the National Digital Archive of Russia, which is an independent project. Next. Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Nerissa Kamar and Dr. Clive Suma provided an overview of access to government information in Sub-Saharan Africa, which includes Kenya, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, South Africa, Nigeria, and Uganda. Um, there are many challenges to accessing government information in these countries, but they uh, indicate that progress is slowly being made. Um, and they give some examples of some of the things that are happening that shows the progress that is being made. For example, the establishment of legal depositories, such as in South Africa, and e-government programs, such as in Kenya, collections and access to statistical information, and the establishment of some depository libraries. So they are slow, slowly moving forward, which is really wonderful to see. Next. United Kingdom. Hannah Chandler and Jenny Grimshaw provided a very useful guide to the development of official publishing in the United Kingdom. There are six official legal depositories in the UK and they work together to ensure that government information is collected, preserved and made accessible to the public. So um, since uh, the UK uh, government depositories have been publishing on the internet since 1994. And in 2001, they developed what they call the UK online, which was a way to provide better access to government information for the general public. And this was, uh, this was changed in 2016 to become gov.uk. Next. 
United States. Cassandra Harnett and, and a number of her colleagues provided a wealth of information on how to access for various parts of the U.S. government information. Most gov U.S. government information is now digital, so it can be found on the internet. Over 1,000 libraries are part of the Federal Depository Library Program, which we call FDLP, and provides access to government information. Uh, they identified some of the, the, the websites that provide information about U.S. government publications. Uh, the Catalog of Government Publications, CGP, provides access to all publications distributed by the FDLP. Also, there is a government website called govinfo.gov, which provides information on Congress and some of the information on the executive branch. Another is congress.gov, which provides information on the U.S. Congress. And finally, NARA, N-A-R-A.gov, which provides information on the National Archive. Next. International government organizations. James Church addressed the nature and origins of international government organization information. He explored former and current functions of depository libraries and documentation centers, trends in IGO open access, and the counter movement of subscription-based digital libraries. He provides strategies for locating substantive material within large bureaucracies. So I, I guess that's my cue. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure we could end there, but anyway, um, thank you very much, Kay. And uh, Kate as well, it was a pleasure working with both of you. There's a little slide for me and um, I think no further introduction is needed. Could we have the next slide please, Kate? So yeah, I just have, um, as Kate mentioned, what I'm gonna talk about today um, is more the story of how we accomplished this feat, uh, the editing and lessons learned. And I can see there I misspelled lessons. So that's not a good, you know, <laughs> sign. Okay. For editing in particular, I that, that, Sorry. that, that is <laughs> mortifying. <laughs> so believe it or not, I was actually, you know, very involved in the editing, but I see that now and my God. All right. So anyway, let's move on. Um, here are some of the key issues that we faced, uh, recruitment, formatting, citations, um, diplomacy, flexibility, and correspondence. So I'm going to address uh, each of these um, one by one. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the overview and the recruitment part about it. Um, the total time period that we needed to complete this process was actually almost 10 years from start to finish. Um, it was initiated, if memory serves, at um, one of the IFLA Congresses, I believe in Helsinki. And of course, naturally, we had the organization in IFLA, which has got its hoops to jump through, as well as, you know, we do in good, or every organization does. We first had to get it approved, cleared, you know, authorized, and then on. And then we were faced with um, the uh, task of recruiting people from all over the world, um, who were willing and able to um, address um, government information, publications, and policy. It took a lot longer than um, we anticipated. Um, we tried, but there were just not that many people who were immediately forthcoming. And we wound up doing eventually is working within our network of IFLA colleagues. So that's a really good place to start. I mean, I was surprised. I thought we might find more volunteers, but surprisingly, it can sometimes be difficult these days for working librarians such as myself to carve at the time to work on a substantial you know, piece such as this, and, and it was. And it also really grew. Uh, at the outset, we didn't have this concept that it was gonna be as long as it was, but um, we found more and more people as time went on. 
and um, you know they contributed substantive chapters. So I think we we're very pleased with the end result, but it did take a lot longer uh, than anticipated. So that's definitely a lesson learned. Plan for a long period of time if ever you're working on a publication. It's probably going to be double at least the amount of time that you expect. Uh, so next slide, please. So again, this is sort of the recruitment. It was, you know, more difficult than expected, you know, to find people around the world willing to submit chapters on publishing and policy. And so, yeah, um, at the end of the day, we uh, wound up primarily relying on colleagues within or had experience uh, with NIFLA. And I know people, I asked a lot of people, but <laughs> um, most people, you know, you know, who submitted chapters wound up from being within the organization with um, the exception of some people that Kay found, for example, for the US portion that was, you know, done, done locally. So that was great. Um, next slide, please. Formatting. Okay, so this is a mistake that we made um, that we've really uh, regretted later. So I'm going to distinguish between the formatting and the citations. So again, we did not originally imagine that this was going to be a 160-page um, document publication. We were thinking more 50, 60 pages at first. So we didn't really go ahead and uh, specify strict formats when we asked the authors to submit it. But then it became clear um, that, you know, the length is going to be quite long. And again, I'm not talking about the citation style, um, whether to use endnotes, footnotes, what's, you know, which format to use. I'm talking about just, you know, the margins, the fonts, uh, whether or not they were going to have an abstract, bullet points, People from all over the world have very different publishing conventions about how you're going to organize something. And uh, it was just wildly different when we got it. So it took a lot of time uh, to reformat everything, uh, standardize the spacing and all. I mean, it was just surprisingly difficult. Um, one of the biggest challenges we faced. So again, a, a lesson definitely learned there. If you don't have a professional editor or a desktop publisher, um, definitely allot yourself some time to do this. Uh, next slide, please. So the citations. <laughs> this was uh, an enormously time-consuming constraint. So again, due to our you know oversight, we didn't specify uh, you know exactly which style to use, and we also had to work with um, various languages: Greek, Russian, Korean, Arabic. And we decided in the end to use you know um, these native languages. So we had to work and make that all fit in. Uh, some chapters contained dozens, <laughs> like many, many citations, which all had to be formatted correctly and checked. We also did not uh, really want to choose uh, an American style manual. So we went uh, with the um, IFLA recommendation, which I believe is Harvard. And the other thing was, of course, is that government information is very link intensive. So we had to check um, every link in the in the you know while we were doing this. So it just took a really really um, long time. Um, next slide, please. So correspondence um, because of the extended time frame and people were working uh, on this over uh, a number of years, we had to uh, maintain contact and touch with them. You know during this time period. And while they were working on this, some authors actually moved and had to be relocated. So again, I can tell you some stories. Some people, you know, actually experienced, you know, natural disasters. One of our authors from Lebanon, for example, happened to be working on his chapter when they had that enormous explosion in the port. So as they were concerned about him, we had to find him. He was fine, but that was something else. Uh, another one of our um, authors, um, from Russia, Anastasia uh, left her job and relocated to um, the Russian countryside and was completely out of contact of all emails. So I had to rely upon uh, my friend from IFLA to go um, locate her. Um, and then there was um, all of the, um, you know, the contract arrangements. And IFLA does specify that whenever you publish with them, at least in this format, that you sign a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international you know, agreement. 
and those needed to be signed by all 22 authors mm -hmm. and returned to IFLA. So that took a lot of time, you know, pursuing and making sure everything uh, was signed. It took, you know, I don't even remember, but it was a lot more than um, we anticipated. And then finally, um, we spent a considerable amount of time. And I want to give a great shout out because IFLA headquarters was uh, extraordinarily helpful. Um, but we needed to work with them on the funding. We needed to work with them on the peer review. The publication was peer reviewed. And so it was submitted to several organizations within uh, the, you know, IFLA bureaucracy who had some expertise in this and they all, you know, represented different sections. So they presented comments, uh, ranks, and they decided like on a scale of one to six, how good is it? Um, and, you know, in the end, I really welcomed their comments and feedbacks because we actually did go back and make some substantive changes um, uh, as a result of the feedback. So I want to like definitely, I know peer review may seem like it's uh, an intimidating process, but I think when it works well, um, it actually can be a, an excellent standard and can result in, you know, a, a better result. So, yeah. So uh, next slide, please. So diplomacy and the flexibility. So if anyone has ever done this, <laughs> you know, if you work with authors anywhere and you have to be in a position where you're going to be editing and making suggestions, uh, it's certainly a good idea uh, to be diplomatic and flexible. Um, so because there are different styles um, globally about how to approach writing, um, you do have to take this in consideration whenever you're doing an international project. So not everybody likes rights like Americans. There's of course difference in spelling, but there's also differences in style, ideas about you know um, how descriptive you should be, how detailed, um, less or more so. Um, so this was something we also had to, to keep in mind. Um, and uh, just uh, work with everybody to make it uh, at once both um, more or less standard, but at the same time, uh, maintain each author's individual uh, personality and cultural style. So this was a very interesting uh, exercise. And what we did do is so we didn't get completely different um, you know, submissions. We did use an outline where we specified the types of topics that we uh, wanted people to engage in. And then there was also just um, some flexibility we need to in engage with, with IFLA headquarters and all of that, you know, because we depended very much on them to, um, you know, get this going and make it happen. And once again, I mean, I can't emphasize enough, um, having a, a good publisher, someone who's on your side willing to help you out um, was really uh, an important part of this process. So, um, I think next slide, I think that's, um, yeah, oh yeah, one more. <laughs> and then um, finding a cover, <laughs> little things that we didn't consider, you know, right at the beginning, like how do you get a cover that is representative of a government information library? So we thought about this, we were like, okay, so we go take a picture somewhere and it doesn't need to be high resolution and this and that and the other. And eventually what we did was we found one that had, um, a government documents collection with a Creative Commons license. You know, we asked permission and uh, discussed it, and then we just used this one, <laughs> sort of an old school government documents collection, and um, we attributed it. But uh, that was also something that um, we did not think of at first about how to best, you know, engage in this. So again, very um, nice and grateful that um, IFLA took, you know, um, our photograph and they created a, you know, they used a template for it. And I think they made it look really great, if I may say. So I think actually that's about all I have and um, hope that was um, helpful and illuminating for any of you uh, interested in pursuing a publication on your own, particularly within a group uh, with involving multiple contributors and authors and sponsored by an organization, all these things need to be taken into account. You know, the informational bureaucracy, working with multiple people, multiple deadlines, uh, being realistic and planning ahead um, are all really crucial. And if you've got sabbatical, that would be great <laughs> because there's absolutely no way I have to say um, that 
I could have finished this or we all could have worked on it together. Had it not been for the pandemic, I had a lot of time at home so to, to work on this. With Not for that, um, I probably would have needed to take off an extended period of time to work on it because it was many, many hundreds of hours, I would say, altogether. Maybe not many hundred, but <laughs> at least a hundred hours. Yeah, it really was. Well, and I'll say to Jim, Jim, to your point about um, something that really struck me during the process uh, was the the link checking because we had been editing um, this late later in the process, right? So we had, like you said, we had to check every single link um, mm -hmm. to make sure that they were accurate, and oftentimes they'd actually um, moved. Or mm -hmm. and then so we would have to for every single one of those links, we'd have to go in and dig around. Yeah. Um, that website and make sure that the link was ac that the new link was accurate and that the content and information that was displayed on the page was reflected in the in the writing by the authors. Um, so uh, and for the most part, I think it was. But I remember really doubting myself um, when I was doing that part of the editing process where I was kind of fact checking our authors, right? Um, because that's what it kind of felt like was fact checking in a way. Um, and yeah. So it was it was sticky and thorny. So okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Kay. Uh, Kay, I apologize. I realized that the slides did not transfer over um, to our PowerPoint today that we wanted them the way they wanted them to. So um, I do apologize for tripping you up there with that. That's okay. <laughs> Survived. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about IFLA and GEOPS, um, provide a few helpful resources if you're interested in getting more into the world of international um, librarianship, uh, learning about how to get involved and why you would be a part of IFLA also. Uh, first off, I realize we may not have covered some of the acronyms that we have been throwing around here. So um, IFLA is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, it's an international uh, service organization. Um, I do think it's a, I'm not sure if it's a nonprofit, um, but it has 150 countries represented and 1,500 members. Uh, GEOPS is the Government Information and Official Publications section, and that is a smaller um, working professional sec section within the IFLA structure and within the IFLA professional committee. So it's very similar to GoDort. Um, we have a large group of members, and then we have a smaller um, standing committee, kind of like a steering committee, and then we have three officers. We have a chair, a secretary, and an information coordinator. Jim is a past chair. Uh, another one of our past chairs, Cornelia Boots, is here today. Um, Kay, Jim, and I have all been on IFLA, uh, on GEOPS, and I've been the secretary for for, I was secretary for uh, eight years and then I've started doing that again. So, um, and the WLIC or WILIC is the World Library and Information Congress. This is the, normally used to be the annual conference and that's up in the air now. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So a couple helpful resources. IFLA does a lot of work um, putting out data and information on the library field, the international library field. So I wanted to highlight just a few things. There's the library map of the world. This is a really nice interactive data tool where you can look at kind of basic uh, library statistics from around the world that IFLA has collected. Um, it's a lot of fun to play around with and I do recommend that you take some time to check that out. There is um, a, a couple big publications that they do every year. There's the trend report. So this identifies five really high level trends in the um, information um, world. So it's shaping the information society, spanning access to education, privacy, civic engagement, and transformation. Um, so here's a link to the 2022 IFLA trend report, but it kind of keeps you um, up to date on what's happening in the field. The IFLA Journal is a peer-reviewed journal uh, with articles on library and information services uh, uh, on issues throughout the world. There's a lot of different international authors in there. I can imagine that the IFLA Journal's work is very similar to what Jim and we went through in editing our, um, our professional report, so I can't imagine doing that for many different um, journal uh, articles throughout the year. But that's a great resource. It's open access. You can find it online very easily. Two big uh, kind of piles of resources that I found to be pretty useful through IFLA are standards and the professional reports. 
Um, the first are standards. So these are up-to-date kind of best practices produced by um, the professional committees, the sections, advisory groups, in consultation with other groups and often other professionals. So you can go to the standards page and find current standards on a lot of different topics. I pulled out a few that I thought were either relevant or interesting. Um, there's the guidelines for legal deposit legislation. There's guidelines for libraries of government departments. Um, there's guidelines for continuing professional development and for public internet access in libraries. So any kind of concept within librarianship, public or academic, special or government, you're probably going to find it um, some sort of standard in there. Whether it's up to date, that's a question, but uh, you're going to find something there. And that's some of the biggest work that IFLA sections actually do is produce standards or professional reports. And that's what this uh, government information landscape and library li library's uh, report was. It was called a re professional report. So these uh, often they report back on the implementation of standards, but they also report on all kinds of other things as well. Um, so you can see a few examples here, document delivery and resource sharing, global perspectives. I think that's very similar to our report where they're kind of profiling what document sharing or resource sharing and document delivery looks like around the world. Creating and maintaining a safer online world for children and young adults in libraries. And uh, kind of a fun one, the world through picture books, librarians' favorite books from their country. So IFLA reports uh, are full of, and they're all, all of this is open source, by the way. All of this is open access, I mean. Um, so you can go onto IFLA's website and um, grab it. Uh, GOPS as a section, we have, I think we're up to uh, 14 or 15 members right now. Um, and we have a newsletter that we get put out each year. We're trying to shoot for two, to two next year, but usually it's an annual newsletter. If you scan this QR code, it'll take you to our uh, to sign up to subscribe to the newsletter so you can get a copy as soon as it's issued. Um, usually we have a report from our chair. Uh, Kay often does a nice interview with an international government information librarian. Uh, we normally have an article from another um, government librarian um, reporting on some sort of work or project that they've done. And then we have information from our IGO partners like the World Bank or the United Nations. So subscribe um, and you'll get filled in on all the activities that we're doing as well. You can join IFLA. Um, you can either join as a personal member or affiliate, or you can see if your organization or institution that you're associated with is a member of IFLA and you might um, be able to join GEOP or you might be able to join IFLA mm -hmm. through that. Um, you can also join our standing committee. Um, so uh, we would love to have you. GOPS uh, is a small committee. Um, at times we've struggled to keep membership up. Uh, we're doing really good right now, thanks to Jim and Cornelia and all of the efforts of the standing committee over the years. But we would love to have you join us. This is where all of our work gets done. We meet every couple months. Um, and right now we're co-opting members for this next term, the 2023 to 2027 term. So this would involve joining IFLA, um, either as an individual or or um, as, a, as an institutional member, I could talk to you about that if you're interested. And then you have to fill out a statement of interest that would go to the um, GOP standing committee and we would uh, determine if we can take on new members or not. So if you're interested in joining us, we would be happy to have you. Why join? Uh, there's lots of good reasons. You can meet librarians from around the world, uh, expand your network in a way that is very different than you would um, in the United States, um, make lots of connections to people that aren't necessarily going to happen through ALA, but there's a lot of cross-pollination there, I would, I would like to add. Um, you can attend conferences in very interesting places. We just got back from Rotterdam this summer. Um, Dublin was last year, been all over the place. Um, 2024 is canceled. Uh, it was going to be held in Dubai, and there were a number of protests and groups that disagreed with some of the organization's decision making around that conference, and the organizing committee pulled out. So um, 2024 was canceled, and we're not sure about 2025. So this is actually a good time to join IFLA because it's going to be not as expensive. Um, you won't, uh, you know, the conferences won't be as pricey to attend. Um, and a couple of other good reasons, you know, building knowledge and professional expertise through the various uh, seminars, workshops, events, etc. And really, to me, this was this was important to me was it was I was able to explore new avenues for my own research or my own um, 
publishing and, and service. There's a lot of different opportunities with IFLA um, than with other service organizations. So hopefully that helped sell you a little bit on joining us in IFLA. We would love to have you. And um, I am going to go ahead and open it up for question and answer from the audience. Thank you very much. And you're welcome to chat or you can raise your hand and we can allow you to talk. We don't have any questions, that's okay too. I have a question for the audience. Is anyone else out there considering um, any kind of professional publication working through an organization or on their own? Jennifer Butcher raised her hand. Hi, Jennifer. Nice to. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, Jennifer. Okay. Hi. Um, always love what you guys do. And, and I'm a big supporter of government sources and always have been even back on microfilm. Um, I have a project that's called the zombie list that is looking to organize historical context of serials. And my biggest problem was finding an open source bibliographic tool that could handle serials. And a lot of, you know, the historical serials are government sources. How did you handle the organization of, of t the time series of the um, sources and it was it a proprietary or was it an open source bibliographic tool did you use or was it an excel because you couldn't find anything that's any good so i'm not quite sure i understand exactly for your but... records for all of the item records because you or, or you guys were just doing collections, not title by title, right? No, no, no. Uh, we did have some titles in there, but it was, you know, collection of chapters. Each of um, them, I'll say mostly, some of them were a little topical. Like we had one on, um, you know, information security, you know, or uh, and we had one on international government. But most of them were country specific. So in each case... Um, the person would write about the government information policies, the types of, you know, information produced, legislative, statistical, and would perhaps mention a few of, you know, the websites that were of interest and talk about, like, say, freedom of information, access to information, um, and so on and so forth. So usually just an approach of how, like, you would work as a reference librarian if you were undertaking to, you know, help someone um, with an interest in a particular country. So you know, if you take a look at the US overview, it's quite you know, extensive about how government information is published, organized, distributed and accessed here. Um, so yeah, um, so I think with the exception of the topic on cybersecurity, they almost all had a country in focus and we didn't make any exhaustive lists of- So within a bibliographic <laughs> list. Right, no. it, it was the policies around all the yeah. access and a policy. No. No. Okay, so how how are you going to keep it evergreen? Because you know, Marrakech changed things, and you know, the U.S. open source versus public domain; those are all changing. And and how? I mean, I, I mean, I hate to ask this, but are you? How do you keep it up? Oh, it's not being updated. This is going to have to remain like a statute, not a code. It'll have to be, you know, blazing at a point in time. Um, we thought about doing a revision. And so if we ever get around to that, what we'd actually like to do um, 
is um, incorporate some uh, countries or regions from around the world where we, you know, did not succeed. Like we really wanted, and this is even mentioned, you know, in the by the editorial team, you know, the peer review people, um, to try to get more, you know, people from, like say Latin America to participate. Um, that was the one region of the world where we just could not. We couldn't find someone. So it'd be volume two. <laughs> or just an expansion, you know, a, ver a revised and extended version would be great to have uh, Latin American contributors. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think even uh, more of a focus on the kind of the uh, ethos or the principles of government publishing um, rather than just the specific sources because um, those are important right but also I think just understanding like how a country like sees the production of government information like in society not just here's the digital library, here's the repository, here's, you know, just having that more of that overview. And a lot of the chapters do have a lot of that because you did mention how these are organized. It's by how information is organized, how it's accessed, how it's preserved. Um, and I think more of an emphasis on that in a future volume would be welcome too, because it's impossible to keep up the the links and all the changes, even that, you know, you know the U.S. federal government information system is undergoing some pretty dramatic changes right now um, that this the chapter on the United States is you know soon going to be more out of date than we'd like it to be yeah with a lot of the countries the authors would cite a specific statute or you know a law passed into gazettes that would point to the country's access to information policies depository libraries of any publishing program so there was a lot of um, legal um, citation throughout throughout the text. You know. Right, right. Well, I so, would also no. say in general that things are changing fast, and and you can see the beginnings in some of these chapters of the new uh, digital uh, information sources that are being developed in countries to give people better access. So it's just going to keep, you know, developing that way. So there are the so it'll get better and better. So I think almost everywhere that's happening. Mm -hmm. And I found when I reviewed all of the chapters that um, at least for these countries and at least for the professionals who work in um, this field, that access to information really was seen as a fundamental right. Um, that's one of the biggest uh, connections that I made between all of the different chapters was that every every uh, country at least stated it. Doesn't mean that they um, act that way or that it's um, it always comes through in how information is published or um, preserved in their countries. But that it's a it's a it's kind of a fundamental. Um, understanding within their countries that it's it's a right to their citizens to have access to some sort of information from their government. And there was also history there. I think right. a lot of people provided historical background about their region or country. So that yeah. was interesting. And everybody shares in the same struggles too. That's another thing that you kind of pull out of there. Everybody has barriers to um, access and barriers to preservation. But I, but I was going to say that an, another good thing that IFLA has done, it's helped a lot of countries like to develop a, a library association in their country, which really strengthens their ability to, to develop go government information sources, but other things too. But that's one of the good things about IFLA is, is helping other countries to, to get their library associations uh, active and doing more. Anybody else with comments or questions?
All right. I gave it the, well, it may not have been 30 seconds, but I gave it probably 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, please uh, scan this QR code to provide feedback on this and other webinars from the HELP Committee. Um, again, see all of our great webinars on YouTube, and um, if you would like to learn about something else, um, I'm still looking for um, a couple presentations for next semester, so at, at the new year. Um, we have one in November, and then we're going to take a break, and then we'll be back in February. So thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you.